Well, good morning. Well, I don't know about that. Good morning. If you're glad to be in God's house, say amen. amen. And happy Father's Day to each and every one of you. I'm so glad that you could make your way out to Leonard's Fork Baptist Church here this morning on this wonderful Father's Day morning. Amen. So good to see so many of you here. And I know some of you, some of our members have gone to be with their fathers at other churches. And I understand that because we got some uh, visitors here as well to be with their family. And that's always understandable. This morning, I really want to talk about a few things that, that's really on my heart as a pastor, you know, always looking to bring forth sound doctrine to our congregation. You're always wanting to lift up men as leaders, not only of the church, but as your home as well. Amen. Men, we are the leaders of the church and we are the leaders of our homes. We are to be Jesus in our homes. We are to, to put forth, we have responsibility. As men on Father's Day, I can't think of anything greater and more wonderful to preach about than what it means to be a godly father, a godly dad, somebody that your children can look up to, want to be like. A few years back, Touchstone Publications did a survey statistically graphing parents' church attendance and the percentage of the time their children would attend as they grow older. So this survey was done to see how much children would attend church as they grew older, comparatively speaking to their parents' church attendance. They found that if both mother and father attended church regularly, that 33% of the time their children would attend regularly as well. If just the mother attended, and thank God for godly mothers regularly, then only 2% of the time their children would be faithful to church attendance in later life. And I'm going to tell you something. This world goes round by godly mothers. Amen. I got a godly mother who stayed on her knees and watched God change my life. And I believe if it would not have been for that godly mother, I don't know where I'd have been today, and many of you have been in the same situation. But looking at this, doctrinally speaking, as God has ordained the family, ordained the man and the woman relationship in the family, 2%. 2% of children will faithfully attend church in later life if only the mother attends. Now, comparatively speaking, if only the dad attends church on a regular basis, then a whopping 44% of the time their children would attend regularly as they grow older. Wow. 44% compared to 2% whether or not the man attends regularly or just the mother attends regularly of whether or not the children will attend regularly as they grow older in life. It seems that a father's dedication to attend church regularly has such an effect on their children that the children's loyalty to church grew even if mom lacked in her efforts to go. Why? That's the way God has it set up. We might ask that question because that is God's prescribed order for the family. The husband slash father is to be the leader of the home. Does that make sense? Yes. When we look at these overwhelming statistics when only mom brings the kids, but yet dad is slack in this. God has ordained the husband-wife relationship in a marriage. Not everything that we see on television today, all this new age marriage and all these other things, that is not ordained by God. Ordained by God was husband and wife. And when that husband attends church as the leader of the ordained relationship, then it just falls into place that things start to happen. Now listen, ladies, don't be discouraged because there's many a mama Many a mama has brought her children to church even though they didn't have a spouse to support them in that. And I thank God for those mamas. Amen. Amen. Builds up our churches. But I just want men to understand this. Pew Research also 
shows that Christian men are less likely than women in seeing the need for weekly church attendance. Now see how these statistics are starting to kind of get altered? The more men who come to church, the greater it is that children will attend in later life. But the fact is, statistics show that men see less of a need in coming to church. These two sets of statistics go hand in hand. The longer men refuse to see the importance of church attendance on a regular basis, the more likely we are to continue seeing a dramatic drop in our younger generation's church attendance. It's just bound to happen. The statistics do not lie. The more that men do not see the need for heavy church attendance, no reason to go all the time. There's no sense in going all the time. There's other things that we can be doing. We can live life. The more we think like that, the less we are showing our children that church matters and the less likely they are to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in later life. Especially a consistent one. Men, it is time that we break the cycle of apathy among Christian men. It's time that we start stepping up and stepping out for the one who stepped out and stepped up for us at Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. Can I get an amen? amen? Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 24. It is a pastor's heart to see men deepen their walk with Christ. It's what it's all about. Because I know if I can get to the men, if I can disciple the men, if I can break through that hard exterior, that hard heart of so many men, if I can get down and, and let him meet the Jesus that loves him and, and wants to grow him, then he will do the same for his family. And then watch the family grow in Christ. We'll see them prosper in Christ. See their lives be forever changed because of their relationship with Christ. And here again, I don't want to take anything away from single mamas and from mamas who have so much pressure at home not to come to church, but they persevere and they get up every morning and they get those kids together and they make their way down to their local church. I thank God for those mamas. Joshua chapter 24. And I thank God for those daddies who do the same thing without a, a helpmate. Verses 13 through 15. And as you find your way there, if you would please, if you can, stand as we honor God's holy, precious, perfect, and authoritative word here this morning. Joshua 24, verse 13 states this. And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not. Do you eat? Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood. Or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house... Hallelujah. We shall serve the Lord. This is the Word of God, and it is undisputed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you humble this morning. We want to slow down just for a moment. We want to hear your Word, understand your Word. Lord God, pay heed to your Word and apply your Word to our lives. We have many Mamas and daddies out here this morning on this Father's Day, Lord. Lord God, as men of the church, men in our homes, Father God, let us learn better how to stand up and be held accountable 
for the lives that we lead, that we are supposed to be leaders in our home, not with some type of iron fist, but with love and sincerity in a Christ-like manner, standing on always the Word of God unapologetically. Father, we love you. Lord, bless this time we have together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And you may be seated. Now, looking at this set of scripture here this morning, how do we break the cycle of the apathetic Christian man? How do we break the cycle of the, the Christian man who has lost his zeal for the things of God and the things of church? How do we break away and how do we change all that and, and, and find ourselves and, and help men become men who want to come to church, who want to serve God? Well, first, write this down if you like to take notes. We need to remember what God has done for us. We need to remember what God has done for us. And I'm going to tell you something here this morning. This applies to men and women. So don't get caught up in thinking about or, or, or elbowing your husband saying, are you hearing this? It goes for anybody in the congregation. Amen. God's words applicable to anybody in the congregation. Amen. Amen. All right. Y'all still awake? Say amen. 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 All right. So looking at this on how to break the cycle, we need to remember what God has done for us. Here in chapter 24, we see Joshua giving his farewell address to the children of Israel. Joshua reminds them of what God has done for them since the days of Abraham and then brings it into a climactic point in our opening text. Look with me at verse 13 real quickly again. He says, And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities in which you did not build, and ye dwell in them, and vineyards and olive gardens which you did not plant, but yet you eat. It looks as though God does so much for us, and I have given to you. Write this down as a sub of a subset of that first point that we're in here this morning. And I have given to you. God tells the children of Israel here in this uh, specific set of texts, he says, I have done this for you. I have given this to you. You didn't have to work for it. You didn't have to do anything for it. I, God Almighty, have done this and given this to you. God mixes no words as he reminds them that the land they are walking on, the houses they are living in, and the food that they eat have all came from God Almighty. The breath in your lungs, everything you do comes from God. He has given you all these things. We cannot forget what he has given us. One of the biggest problems I see with Christian men who have stumbled in their attendance to the church and, and their obedience to God is the fact that they have failed to remember what God has done for them. Many times people become apathetic because they fail to remember what God brought you out of, what God saved you from, or even by chance of that he took you out of blindness. And we're going to see that in just a moment. We must remember as Christians, men and women, what God has done for us in our lives. Count your many blessings, the song says. Amen. Count your many blessings. Are you counting the blessings from God? One of the reasons that I stay so diligent in my attendance and in my ministry and in my scholarship is because I never, ever, ever want to go back to being the man that I used to be. That's one of the reasons I stay so. People say, well, preacher, you get paid. I don't care. A paycheck won't keep you living for the Lord. It might keep you coming in here in the pulpit every Sunday morning to get a paycheck, but it will not keep you living for the Lord. And before long, your life will show it if you're not. One of the reasons that I'm so thankful to God that I, that I do have zealous attendance and I, whether I was in this pulpit or not before, 
God would have never let me in this pulpit if I wasn't been the way he wanted before I came into this pulpit. And we have to understand that as men and women of God. Be diligent in all these things. I can remember the times that I spent in jail. I remember the times that I spent in rehab. I remember the times that I spent in the hospital from the lifestyle that I was leading. I can remember losing my job, losing my house, losing everything I had. But I can also remember God in his loving mercy reaching down and picking me up off the floor and giving me a life worth living. Only God can take a drugged out drunk out of a ditch and put him in a pulpit. We must never forget what God has done for us is key to your relationship with Jesus Christ to remember who he is in your life what he's done for you because I'm going to tell you something dear ones things can get good and when things get good we have a tendency to forget we have a tendency to relax in our blessings and we start thanking the blessings instead of the blesser. We start thanking God for the blessings instead of thanking God for being God. And we forget where we've come from. Now, whether or not you have the same testimony, mine does not matter. Because you fall, and if you fall under the blood-stained banner of the Lord Jesus Christ here this morning, you once were lost, but now you are found. You were once blind, hallelujah, but now you see. You were bound for hell, but now you have a home in heaven. This is what God has done for you. If you need reminding, maybe you weren't the person that I was. Don't matter. You were lost and undone without a Savior and going to hell until Jesus Christ saved your life. Period. Twelve-year-old kid who's never done anything remotely to what we consider the big six sins of our day. When he reaches that age of, or she reaches that age of accountability, and chooses not to follow Christ, they have made a choice. And they too will go to hell if they do not choose Christ as their Lord and Savior. It does not matter. Your mama can't get you into heaven. A church role can't get you into heaven. Sunday school role cannot get you into heaven. Men, unless we want to lose another generation of our children, we need to remember beyond a shadow of a doubt what God has done for us in our lives. If we fail to remember these things, if we fail to, to truly understand the impact that it has on our society, on our culture, on our children, then we too will lose another generation. And we'll watch them go further and further away from God till they don't even know where to come back to to find Him. Now, looking at this, not only do we need to remember what God has done for us, but you can write this down. We need to realize how he wants us to live. We remember what God has done for us, and that's great. That keeps us hopefully diligent in our scholarship. But now we need to know how he wants us to live. Are we living the way God wants us to live? Are we doing the things that God wants us to do? Look with me again at verse 14 real quickly. It says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away, look at that, put away, put away, put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Put away all the false idols, put away all your wants, all the things that keep you away from God, all the things that keep you from serving the one true God, Jesus Christ, Jehovah God, the one who died for you 2,000 years ago. Put all those things away and serve him. Amen? amen. Y'all wake, say amen. amen. I am preaching way better than y'all amen in this morning. <laughs> I might just go to the house. Amen? Y'all want that? All right, let's keep going. All right. 
Here we find three specific traits that a godly man should adhere to when it comes to living for God. See, we need to understand that as men. What are the traits? What does it look like to serve God as a man? What, 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 is this, what should this be? What should this look like as a man serving God? First, fear of God. Secondly, service of God. And thirdly, separation from the world. First, we must fear God. Proverbs 9, 10 states this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Only through fear of the Lord can we gain the wisdom that we need to live this Christian life. And only through fear of the Lord can we gain the wisdom we need to be the biblical men that God wants us to be. Fear of the Lord keeps you in check. Listen, we, I, I'll make, you know, we make jokes about stuff. Say, I, my wife will say stuff all the time. And she'll see somebody doing something on TV. It, we'll be watching a, a fake show, just some crazy show where somebody's being mean to elderly people or something. And she'll say, well, they're going to have to pay the price when they get to heaven over that, I'm telling you right now. I'd be scared to walk out the door. I'd get struck by lightning if I'd done that. Well, there's some truth to that. There's some truth to that. Do you fear God? It's not a matter of fear like you fear some bad thing. It's a matter of fear of not only respect, but a true godly fear. Look what God has done for you. I think about not only the respect and love I have for God for what he's done for me, but I know that if he needs to, he'll take everything away from me just to get me back where I need to be. And he won't, he won't bat an eye over it. Why? Because he loves me that much. Well, how can you say he loves me if he's going to take away all this stuff because he loves you so much he don't want to continue to watch you go down that same path over and over again. He loves you so much he puts the stop sign out and says, don't go no further. And then he sinks your boat if you're going down the river toward a waterfall and almost drowns you just so you'll get over to the shore. And you say, but God, you almost drowned me. He said, yeah, but look what was coming. God will, we need to fear God. God will do many things in our lives to keep us on track. And when he does that, because he loves us. Secondly, we must serve God. Luke 10, 27 states this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You want to know how you can serve God better? Love him more and love them more. How can I serve God better, preacher? Love him more and love his people more. Love thy neighbor as thyself. We talk about this in 1 John all the time. You want to show, you want to reveal your Christianity. You want to re reveal the fact that you're a blood-bought child of the, the king. Love on people. It'll be unmistakable. It'll be unmistakable about your patience with folks and your love that you have for people who make you mad, people who drive you crazy, people that normally you would say, listen, I'd just rather walk on the other side of the road if I have to that I would to see those. Love on those people. Why? Because that's when Jesus flourishes in you. Love him more and love people more. Thirdly, we must separate ourselves from the world. 2 Corinthians six seventeen states this, come out from among them and be ye separate. In verse 14, Joshua tells the children of Israel to put away all the false gods that they grew up around and serve the Lord. I don't care what it is. If it takes you away from God's house, if it takes you away from God's people, if it puts you in a place that is not conducive with a Christian relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, then put it away out of your life. It's that simple. Joshua tells the children of Israel, you've got to put away these false gods. Anything that takes your mind off of Jesus, anything that takes you out of the house of God, anything that keeps you out of the temple, you need to, you need to put 
those things behind you. Separate yourself from those things. Is there something that keeps you out of God's house on a regular basis? I've seen people quit jobs when they become a Christian because the job kept them out of God's house every Sunday. And I watched God give them more than they could have ever, ever imagined at the job that they worked. Now, you've got to listen to him and let him tell you what to do and how to do it. But I've seen that happen personally. God has a plan for all of us. We must separate ourselves from the world, from worldly people. Listen. When you deal with drug addicts and alcoholics, when they go through rehab, the first thing that they tell you is when you get back on the outside, you have to separate yourself from all your old friends, all your old buddies. Why? Because they're not conducive to a sober lifestyle, right? Because they're still living the way they live. They're not doing anything. Listen, I mean, they're doing something wrong, but they're not hurting you. They're just living their life. And so the rehab people will say, listen, you, you got to stay away. The AA people say, listen, you got to stay away from those people that you used to do all these things with because they'll suck you back in. You'll get drawn back in. Everybody wants to go back out and hang out with their same friends, but be the sober one. Let me go ahead and tell you, that don't happen. That never, ever happens. They are stronger than you are. Your will is weak, and you will be right back where you started. Just ask me. I've been there a million times. you got a million other guys who's done the same thing in here. Same way with Jesus Christ. When you come to the Lord, you got to separate yourself from all those old buddies. you got to separate yourself from that wicked lifestyle. you got to walk away from that stuff. Why, well, why can't I just be an on-fire Christian and still hang out with the same guys I used to drink and party with and go to the same places they do? Because they will bring you down. Amen. They will keep you from living the life that Christ wants you to live. You have to separate yourself from the world. Amen. Come apart from them and be ye separate. Finally, if we truly want to break the cycle of the apathetic Christian man, you can write this down, we must respond to this world by taking a stand. We must respond to what the world's got going on. Listen, open your eyes, watch the news. The world and the way it carries itself and the way it acts and the things that it says is normal is not normal to the Christian lifestyle. It's not normal to the Word of God, to what God would say that we need to do. So we must respond to this world by taking a stand. Look with me at verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, then you choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, that was before the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell right now, the place that you're at. Look at that for us today. The gods of this society we live in, this time in history that we live in, are you going to serve these gods? But as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. That's what Joshua says. Are you going to serve Maybe your parents were not Christians. Maybe they were Jehovah's Witnesses or some other cult or whatever. Are you going to serve the gods of your parents? No? Okay. Are you going to serve the gods of this world, of this land in which you dwell? And we see what those gods are, the things we see on television. He says, listen, if you're a Christian... And you want to serve God, then you've got to choose today whom you're going to serve. Men, we have to choose today who we're going to serve. We cannot continue. And I'm talking to old men, young men, middle-aged men, everybody alike. You cannot continue to go down the road that we go by saying, you know what, it's all going to be okay. Well, I don't have to be so, I'm not the preacher. The Bible doesn't really pinpoint any place but one place that we have some differences. The rest of the time we're all to act the same. We're Christians. We're to carry ourselves in the same manner. 
we're going to have to take a stand. Men, we're going to have to take a stand and say, you know what, I'm not going to live this way or live that way. Joshua sums this portion of the text up as every Christian father or mother should by taking a stand. Joshua says that he doesn't care what other people do, how other families act, or what wickedness pulls them away. He states, as for me and my house, hallelujah, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't care that this family over here has, has all these activities that they do with their children and they're gone every Sunday morning and they're gone every Wednesday night and they do these things. I don't have to answer for that family. I've got to answer for mine. I've got to talk to God. I've got to answer to God for how I raised my kids. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He makes that very simple. And very direct. Men, you're going to answer for your children. Oh, there'll come a day where they'll have to answer for themselves. But you'll have to answer for your children, for keeping your children away from God, for not having your child in church the way you should have your child in church. And being around and fellowshipping with others like mine. Watching out who they play with, who they hang out. Will I like so and so and them up there, they're good people. Are they Christians? Do they go to church? And do they love the Lord? If not, who cares? You witness to them, you love them like you would anything else, but you don't let your kids be with them. They're going to show them and teach them and act in ways that is not conducive to a Christian man or woman raising their family. Period. Preacher, that's harsh. You better believe it is. Joshua told these children of Israel to separate yourself. Separate yourself from this world. And he says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God Almighty. I don't care what all these other families do. I don't have to answer for all these other families. I know that children don't understand sometimes. I've done a ton of research just this morning just to see how many things I could come up with about should I make my kids go to church. In this society we live in, they're letting kids choose if they want to be boys or girls. Should I let my children, well, you know, they, if they don't want to go, preacher, is it any good for them? I don't know. Did they want to go to school Monday morning? But you still made them go. Why? Is it just because you'll get locked up? Or you know this what they need to so they can survive in this world, have an education. Amen. Same way with church. But they don't want to go. You make them go. Why? Because it's where they need to be. And you're going to have to answer for it if you don't. You will answer to God for it. You will answer to God for it. I can remember early on in my walk when the Lord was getting me sober. I remember going into, and Zach brought this up the other night, talking about separating and making choices. I remember going into a bar that had a restaurant on the other side, and I've told this story many times, but I remember that day just the Holy Spirit really laid a choice on my heart. I had a choice of staying in the restaurant or walking into the bar. My friend walked into the bar. I walked up to the edge of the door, and, and the Holy Spirit laid on my heart and said, you are now leaving the light and entering into darkness. And so I had a choice to make. I had to take a stand, which is this point we're on. Men, you're going to have to take a stand. Every time you want to do something that is not lining up with the Word of God, every time you want to do something that seems fun or, or whatever else it might seem, but you know that you need to be in church, you know you need to have your family in church, you know they might even go kicking and screaming, but it's what it's right to do. You're going to have to take a stand because it falls on you. It falls on you, men. I hate to be the bearer of this news to you this morning, but that's what the Word of God says. You are the leaders of your home under His direction. We have to apply God's Word to our lives. We have to take a stand for the Word of God. As I close, I want to give a challenge, give the same challenge to all the men here that Joshua gave to the children of Israel, choose you this day 
whom you're going to serve. It's so easy. It is so easy not to choose the right thing or to choose it partially. Partial obedience, and this is a big scholarly debate. Partial obedience, I say, is full disobedience, period. Being partially obedient to God is really just being disobedient to God in some aspect of your life. Well, I, you know, I make sure we go to church and we do these things, but I do this, this, and this. Well, you're fully disobedient in this, this, and this. You're still disobeying God. To choose you this day who you're going to serve. Your selfish flesh or the Lord Jesus Christ. The walk of your family. I want you to get this. The walk of your family and your church depends on it. Who are you going to serve? Your wants, your desires, your flesh, your thoughts. Well, I, I don't think God minds. I wouldn't go around thinking. I'd go around knowing what God says. Are you going to serve your flesh? Or are you going to serve the Lord? Your children's walk with Jesus in the future depends on it. And so does the church you belong to. What do you think it's like when we have a church full of half-hearted Christians? How much can a church get done when it's full of half-hearted Christian men who could care less one way or the other? Or men who send their families off to church but they stay at home because they don't want to go or they don't think they need to as the statistics showed earlier in the service. How good is that church going to operate when you got people leading it like that? It won't. God wants us to serve him, and he wants us to make a choice. Please stand.